All right. So good afternoon, everyone. Thanks again for joining us. Um, my name is Sarah Husky with 3C Ren. I've started recording this course and it will be posted on our on demand page. Uh, we have Nick Brown and Robert Fortunato to talk with us today about electrical panel constraints for all electric retrofits. Uh, before we get going, I just have a couple slides to run through. Uh, we just ask that everyone make sure that you're on mute throughout the duration of the course, but if you would like to ask a question, please feel free to raise your hand and we will call on you to unmute yourself. Um, also, we will be monitoring the chat, um, so please enter any questions there as well and we'll be sure to get those answered. Next slide. Hey, thank you. Um, so for those of us who might be unfamiliar with who we are, we are the Tri-County Regional Energy Network, also known as 3C Ren. We're a collaborative partnership between San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura counties, working to improve energy efficiency in our region by offering free programs and services for building professionals and households. 3C Ren is funded by ratepayer dollars, which are collected through the public goods charge found on our utility bills. And the benefit of being ratepayer funded is that there's no cost to those we serve and we're able to return these dollars back to our local economy. And 3C Ren currently offers uh, three programs, actually six programs. We're launching three new ones, which are um, on our website now. Um, but our first program here is our Energy Code Connect program, which serves building professionals by offering Title 24, Part 6 and Part 11 supports. Um, Within the Energy Code Connect program, we have our Energy Code Coach service, which is an over the phone online and in the field support for residential and non-residential projects. And then we of course have trainings like the course brought to you today. Um, our next program is our building performance training. And this one is our um, workforce education training that serves uh, buildings, building professionals by offering technical and soft skill trainings related to building science principles, high performance buildings, um, and uh, marketing and communication techniques. And then our um, other program here is our home energy savings program, which incentivizes contractors and helps residents save money uh, to make their homes healthier with energy efficient upgrades through incentives and rebates. And with that, I'll pass things over to Nick. Thanks so much, Sarah. Did you want to plug your upcoming three new programs? 3C REN is <laughs> yeah. an overachieving REN. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're still working on updating our PowerPoint slides, um, but our three new programs is a commercial energy savings, uh, which is an incentive program for small to medium businesses. And then we have our agri ag uh, Ag Energy Solutions Program, oh, cool. and that is our agriculture um, technical assistance program that will go out and do site audits and evaluate utility bills um, for, right now we're focused on indoor ag, so the controlled, uh, controlled environments. Um, and then our third program is our Energy Assurance uh, Services Program, which uh, supports making local community centers resilient during emergencies so that they can keep their lights on during an emergency. Um, so but yeah, those are our three new programs. Um, our commercial one launched October 1st um, and the other two are still in development, but all three are currently on our website um, with interest forms and a little bit more information. Congrats. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> all right. Well, what a great turnout. Hi, Robert. How are you today? Hey, I'm doing great, Nick. I can't wait to launch this thing. Brand We've been new talking course. about this for years and years, the problems with, you know, the panel. Uh, and so we were just so excited to pull all this together and, and share this with everybody. We've been wanting to do this forever. And so thank you, Sarah, right. for the opportunity. Because we've been teaching electrification classes now for, I think it's five years, Robert. Absolutely. And panel gets one slide right <laughs> yes. and we keep yes. getting the feedback this is this is a bigger issue than one slide can solve 
Uh, so that's how this came to be. And I'm thrilled to see a bunch of familiar names already in the roster. Clearly, this class hit a hit a nerve with a number of you because I know uh, your time is very precious. So appreciate you showing up. This is how we've organized it. Uh, we'll do quick introductions, including Robert and I will talk about how we electrified our homes. But briefly, this class is not that class where we cover the reasons why you should be electrifying and how to do it. There are lots of other classes for that, including the one we're teaching for Southern California Edison, which is next week, called Planning Your Home Electrification Project. Um, three evenings and we kind of walk you through the process, but we're going to go quickly through that part and instead focus on how the National Electrical Code requires panel size be calculated, tools that you can use to hold your electrician accountable and make sure that their recommendations are appropriate. And most of our time will be spent making a small panel work, including what do we have? Three case studies, I think. Maybe so, four. Yeah, maybe it's four. Yeah. So anything, any questions in particular? I don't see anything in chat, but like Robert said, we love to keep it interactive. So if you do want to unmute and blurt something out, now's your moment. Robert, you want to introduce yourself first? Sure. I'm going to share the screen. Go for it. But I'll, I'll stop just, oh, there it goes. There it goes. All right, can you see it now, Nick? Yep, we're in business. Perfect. My name is Robert Fortunato. I'm the president of Force Strategy Consulting and the owner and the builder of what is known as the Green Idea House. It's one of the first net zero energy, zero carbon case study houses that was actually built for less cost than standard construction but we use standard construction materials and off-the-shelf technology. So it wasn't some sort of spaceship or mud hut or some sort of science project. We wanted people to be able to walk in and say, hey, I would want to live here too. Uh, that was really the, uh, the purpose of it. And we did it 12 years ago. And 12 years ago, it was really novel to disconnect the gas line. We had to call the gas company four times because they actually didn't believe that we were going to disconnect <laughs> the gas line. And, uh, and we did a TED talk uh, about it uh, a couple of years after, uh, after we understood exactly what was working and what wasn't working and uh, sort of the story through it. So if you wanna hear that in 18 minutes, um, we're not gonna repeat it here, but there's a lot of good information in there about how we did it, uh, which might be helpful to you if you're in the process of thinking about how to do it. Um, this is the old house, uh, 1959 post and beam construction, 1,300 square feet. And we transformed it into the Green ID house, which you see on the right, which is 2,100 square feet. Um, and again, we came out of the ground in 2012. We actually didn't have the ribbon cutting until 2013 because we saw a lot of these green projects where people would stand in front of the building and say, hey, it should do this, it should do that. And, and nobody knew at that point what it was going to do. So we actually wanted to have the bills in hand and have a, a year's worth of experience in operating the building before we actually did it. And um, it was a wonderful event. I wish I had pictures because we had Ed Bigley Jr. and a number of other people, really fun people uh, there uh, to celebrate what we did as a community to bring that together. Um, and this is what we wanted to know when we were hunting around and looking for these case studies. Uh, we wanted to know, you know, does it actually work and how much does it cost? Um, ours ended up being um, $200 a square foot. And as you can see, this is the Southern California Edison bill. And if you're not familiar with it, um, every one of the bars is a month. Every bar that's above the line, we're using more energy than we, we harvest we, um, you know, with our solar system. And every bar that's below the line, we're harvesting more energy than we actually use. So you can see very clearly uh, that this building is net zero energy. We have two electric cars. We actually fully power two electric cars and still are net zero most years at the end of the year, unless we've driven quite a bit. Uh, you know, it's, it's you know, dependent on the, the drive time uh, at this point, but generally we're net zero energy by the end of the year as well. Um, this is our old hot water system and heating system, uh, 1959 vintage, you see it on the left there. Uh, and there were uh, just a number of problems with it um, because it 
you know, it didn't properly ventilate. And some of the, you know, the carbon emissions actually came back into the house uh, as a result of, you know, that mess that you see there. And um, our hot water tank is on the right hand side for showers and our heating system is on the left with the bigger tank. It's really that simple uh, for our house. Uh, and we will talk a little bit about what we might do differently uh, going forward from here, but uh, we ended up with a very simple build as a result of uh, what we did. Uh, we went from co you know, um, resistance coils in the cooktop to an induction cooktop uh, that looks still looks brand new today, and it works so well. Uh, we can't tell people enough how much better than gas this um, you know induction cooking is, how much better and safer and better for your health uh, at the same time. Um, talking about my generation, a lot of people talk about the degradation on solar panels. You know that over time it's going to you know be less and less effective and. Uh, we have the data. It's just not true. <laughs> so these solar panels are putting out just about exactly what they put out when we bought them new. Uh, you know, maybe a couple of points, but nothing significant at all. And Nick has, you know, a, a very similar uh, condition and story. Um, and this, at the end of the day, has to come down to money and your health, I think. Uh, you know, those are the things that we find most attractive to people. Uh, and we saved over $52,800 in the 11 years. And there's uh, obviously another year I have to update the slide for. Um, the payback period is 3.7 uh, years at 18000 is what we paid for the system. It's a 6.5 kilowatt system, so it uses about a third of our rooftop. And that was... 12 years ago. So today it would use even less because the panels are that much more efficient. Um, and you can go through the rest of the stats, but it's, it works, you know, and it pays back like an annuity. Uh, so, you know, it's really, really powerful. Uh, what is the opportunity there? And both, I think the difference in this class is that both Nick and I um, actually designed and general contracted these houses ourselves. So we didn't just, you know, we're not just pushing the slide button here on slides that we invented. The reason we're so passionate about it is we live this every single day and we understand how well it works and we understand where the snafus are in the process as a result of, you know, designing it and general contracting and hiring and buying all the materials ourselves. And that's what we want to share with you, what, we, what we've learned through the process. And so we're happy to do that. And back to you, Nick. Thanks, Robert. And Robert, in part, inspired my own journey as well. Here you can see my house on Long Beach, where I'm broadcasting from today. Uh, we finished it in 2016. It wasn't all electric originally, uh, much to Robert's chagrin. But we've since corrected that deficiency. It's now all electric. Um, I run a company called Build Smart Group that, in part, grew out of the experience uh, remodeling this deep green retrofit. Um, and I'm a certified energy analyst now, which means that I do energy modeling of buildings and work with architects to make buildings more energy efficient. And you can see it's a, a attractive place to live too, uh, not a mud hut like Robert was saying. And then in uh, 2022, we added an ADU above the garage. Um, designed it so it blends in and looked like it was done around the same time. And that we got right from the start, all electric, designed to be zero net carbon. And so our experience putting two homes on one electrical draw from Southern California Edison is one of our case studies that we'll use at the end of the class. But the ADU also very comfortable. You wouldn't know it's all electric. In fact, I I doubt the tenants even tell their visitors uh, that they're in an all electric zero net carbon house. So real quickly, how did we do the ADU all electric? Well, with a ductless mini split heat pump, uh, two interior units and one outdoor unit as shown here, very unobtrusive, they work great, very efficient, quiet, uh, and they use about two kilowatt hours a day. The heat pump water heater we installed in the garage underneath the ADU so I could keep an eye on it and change the filters. It's 240 volt, 30 amp. We don't usually focus on the electrical requirements, but that's our focus here today. So that's a fair amount of power that a heat pump water heater takes. Um, but it's very efficient as well, been 
incredibly trouble free and uses about one kilowatt hour a day to keep that household of two in hot water. Here's their slide in induction range from frigid air, nothing too expensive or fancy. There's a lot more models on the market now than when Robert and I did our original remodel, um, including some really cool looking ones. If, if, if you really want that home cooking appliance to be a showpiece like many people do. And then we did a stacked heat pump dryer and washer from Miele in a little interior closet. So that was how we built that all electric, nothing to it. When it came to retrofitting the main house, we had to replace this gas tankless water heater with a heat pump water heater. And by then 120 volt units had come out, which is ideal for retrofits because it used the existing receptacle right there on the wall. Um, so these days I would recommend that 120 volt ream heat pump water heater to anyone. It's been trouble free. And we built a little outdoor enclosure around it. As you can see here, the door wasn't on yet at this in this picture. Um, and it's worked just great. We electrified the gas furnace next with what's called a multi-position air handler for Mitsubishi. You see, it's the same rough size. We took out that air handler furnace combination and hoisted up this uh, heat pump, changed out the outdoor unit as well, and used the same power circuit that the air conditioner alone used. It actually frees up the circuit that your air handler was using when you switch to a heat pump like this. And they work much less, much more efficiently thanks to being inverter driven and variable speed. Uh, then in the main house, we replaced our gas dryer with this Miele heat pump dryer. In fact, we did this before we be built the ADU, so we knew it worked really well. It seems gentler on our clothes. It's been completely trouble free as well. And the one thing we got right from the start, we put induction cooking in in the main house and it all like Robert been thrilled with how that works. The experience is, is good enough that it gets me cooking most nights, which my wife is appreciative of. Robert, anything in chat before you launch yeah, we, into this quick session on electrification? We have a, a couple of them. Uh, the first one's a little curious. I'm, I'm actually not sure and so if Tony, if you could chime in and let us know a little, little bit more clarity, because Nick, Nick had the second, you know, he seconded the request, but would like your view of very old panels uh, that still has pull fuses as part of the electrical system. Also, your thoughts on this Zinsco and other problematic panels. I don't know if I'm a, an expert uh, in that arena. Um, you know, we went with Solar World uh, panels uh, back then, um, and they got purchased by somebody else. And you know, it's there's a little bit of a, a circus going on um, with the cheap Chinese panels that came in, and then the you know the everything. And we don't need to go into all the detail on that, but uh, I'm not sure if we're experts. But if you can clarify the question in a way that we might be able to be helpful, uh, happy to do that. And then um, <clears throat> Chris uh, Christian wanted to know: Have you tracked how many times? Over one year, the heat pump hot water heater has needed to use the electric resistance coil. And I can I can speak to that for my system. And for my system, we actually turned it off. Um, so those, the unit that I have also runs off 240, uh, it needs 240 plug. But um, the only reason it needed that is because of the 4,500 watt resistance heater that it had in it. And we didn't need that resistance heater because it has a tank and the heat pump can more than adequately cover all of our needs for three people uh, in our house. And, um, and so, you know, you can easily just with the buttons on the front of the machine, turn that off. Uh, and, and we advise people to do that or not even buy the 240 version uh, just, you know, and, and we'll cover this in the class <clears throat> that you can free up a lot of panel space by just buying the 110, 120 version and just plugging it into the wall. Uh, and so that's one of the things we're going to discuss. So thanks, um, 
you know, uh, Christian, uh, for bringing that up. And I've had uh, the same experience. We, we locked out the electric resistance element in the unit that serves the ADU and they've never had any issue. Yep. All right. So, um, Nick, I'm going to continue on and, um, yeah, folks are chiming in about the Zinsco panels, uh, but I'm just going to keep on, keep on rolling. Yeah. Why don't you okay. take control and yeah, share from I'll do your that. End? I will do that. So it bounced back to the non-presentation mode. So sorry about that. Okay. Oh, now it's go. in presentation mode. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Yeah. I don't know why it does that. Okay, here we go. Okay, and 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 we're just going to cover this very quickly. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what's in it for you? There's a ton of incentives right now, um, more than we've ever seen, and we've been doing this work for ten years now. Um, so there's you know <clears throat> a ton of reasons why to do this. Um, and one less utility is one of our biggest reasons uh, not to have the gas company bills or anything to do with another utility as you're going through the development process. It just makes it so much easier and faster to do development uh, in our experience. Lower utility costs, uh, especially with solar. We know that all electric with solar is far, far less expensive, uh, as I showed you in the previous slide. Gas stoves increase the, you know, the, the noxic, toxic fumes in your house. Uh, so uh, the increase in childhood asthma as a result of just having a cooktop, a gas cooktop in your house is significant. Um, so the issues related to foreign energy, reduced external pollution, GHG emissions, better backup power. We're going to talk about that a little bit in an emergency. You can't make gas on your roof, but you can make electricity on your roof. Um, so, you know, in terms of independence, improved lifestyle, all that coming together with billions of dollars in incentives makes it much, much easier. And we're lucky to have Nick Brown with us because he's one of the best modelers in the state, especially around this issue. And it all of this makes energy code compliance just that much easier uh, for all of us. So tons of incentives. We're not going to go into all the details today, but they're all there uh, for, um, for tax incentives, um, that is tax credits, or if you're uh, in a disadvantaged community, there's just even more money to be had in this realm. Um, all electric designs re reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. A lot of people talk about greenhouse gas, but I just call it pollution. You know, it's less pollution and we know what's happening in Florida and everything else like that that is related to greenhouse gas emissions and we can and should reduce them. Um, we, uh, I mentioned that the American Medical Association study of childhood asthma, you know, we want to get these things out of our homes and stop polluting the environment with uh, natural gas. Um, and code compliance is getting much, much easier as a result of what we've done there. The state is doing that. So now we're going to focus really and really dive deep on the panel issue. That, and that's really what we've been dying to talk about for a long time, because a lot of people come to us and they say, hey, Robert, I can't do this because my panel's not big enough, or I'm having problems with my contractor. And they're saying I need a 400 amp panel. This literally happened to me. And I'm going to talk through what happened and why this is so important. I mean, I mean, it's a consumer protection kind of thing because we see people putting far, far too much into their building that they actually will never, ever use. Uh, so we're going to talk about, um, you know, about those things. So, um, you know, starting in terms of what, what's in it from the panel perspective, why you should pay attention to this, why this is important for you and your clients. Uh, number one, on average, you can save 3,000, maybe lots more. Um, Again, I had a client who came to me and he said, I'd, I'd love to, you know, I saw what you're doing and I'm really interested in it. And we got into a conversation. They said to us, um, you know, hey, we're interested in, in doing an all electric house, but you know what? We feel like we need a gas cooktop. We need a fireplace outside. We need a fireplace. And like they started just lobbing on all of these other, you know, gas usage. Um, and it's obvious they weren't really up for the exercise. And so I said, you know what, you're going to build your building and do whatever you're going to do, but that's not something I want to be affiliated with. And so they went ahead. And so they were using gas for a number of different appliances. Um, they were going forward, they got halfway through their build and their contractor said to them that they needed 
not only a 200 amp panel, but they needed a 400 amp panel. And they didn't know what to do at that point. So they came back to me and say, hey, Robert, can you help calculate? And I said, there's no way in any circumstance, even if you were running a welding shop, did you need <laughs> a 400 amp panel? And they had to acquiesce. The contractor would not let go of it. And they spent an additional $9,000 for a panel that they will never, ever, ever need or use. But if they had the information from this class, they could have combated it earlier. And so this is what we want to share with you. Um, you know, and, and sorry for the little uh, story, but I, I wanted to illuminate how dangerous this can be by not having the right information walking into this conversation uh, it's just, it's endless what we see. Um, we also wanted to help people uh, save on a service line upgrade to the transformer. Um, if you don't need it, you don't need it. So why spend extra money on something you don't need? And, and we'll talk about when you do need it. Um, you know, in our particular case, we really didn't know what we were doing 12 years ago. And we had, a, you know, we forged ahead anyway. And we, you know, I think we made some some good moves and some things we would do differently, quite frankly, uh, as a result of, and we'll talk about that. Solar and batteries can go better and longer in an outage if you're doing the things that we recommend here. Using smaller amperage appliances will give you more uh, resiliency in the uh, in, when the power goes out. Not if the power goes, goes out, but when the power goes out. And we're all in those territories, whether it's a fire or an earthquake or something, um, that is a problem. Uh, you want to avoid upsizing of the transformer, specifically in multifamily buildings. Um, people are not planning for this effectively, and they're having to double and triple the size of the transformer, whereas if they pared that down in terms of the consumption, the load, um, these things would not be as big of an issue. Um, and then there's a sort of societal thing that's related to this that we want to pay attention. We want to avoid upsizing, upsizing of the grid and the related cost to that because we all end up paying for those things as a part of the utility charge. Um, so every time the utility adds something to the grid, they get paid to do that. That's how they get paid uh, by upgrading you know, the services on the grid and they get paid a, an 11% bump every time that they do that. So the less that they have to put on the grid, the less that they have to charge us. And ultimately we're seeing you know, utility rates skyrocket as a result of this upgrading of the grid where sometimes it's not even necessary. And we're gonna talk about how to do it less expensively for everybody, including society. And, and as a result of that, we wanna make decarbonization easier for all. And that's the, the end goal. So from an individual standpoint, all the way to a societal standpoint, there's a great reason to pay attention to these issues. And bigger is not always better. Uh, we wanna to get to a load profile that serves your needs and future proofs your building adequately. Uh, so we don't want you to feel like you're skimping on something or missing something. We feel it's all there, it's all possible to do. And we wanna leave you a little bit of headroom at the end. Uh, at the end of the process, we wanna make sure there's room for solar, batteries, and EV. EV charging is critical. And um, because we know by 2035, all new vehicles sold in the state of California will have to be EV. You probably still get an old, you know, internal combustion engine. But by that point, you know, EVs we know are getting less expensive. They're getting better. The range is getting better. And from our experience, Nick and I's experience, we haven't had to do any maintenance on our our EVs. It's really tires and windshield wipers and not to have to go in for oil changes, spark plugs and all the rest of the nonsense that goes with these internal combustion engines. It's so good, let alone not having to go to, go to the gas station every week, right? Um, so it's just better. And so what we're saying is uh, a lot of people are attempting to put in really fast chargers in, into their house. Um, and if you had the headroom to do that, you know, and it's really important for you for super fast charging. In our own experience, driving electric cars for 12 years, I've never had to really quickly charge my electric vehicle. It's sort of like my, my phone in that, you know, at nighttime, I plug it in and in the morning it's fully charged and then I use it for the day and then I come back and I plug it in. It's very much analogous to that. So um, in the scenario that we see it too often, uh, people go and they attempt to put in a very large um, 240 volt charging system on a 40 amp uh, breaker. And we just feel like that's 
overkill for most people. You just don't need that much charging that fast. Um, and a lot of cars can't even take it. Um, so we had uh, the first generation Bolt, um, which, or uh, no, I'm sorry, the first generation, we had the first generation Mitsubishi and we had the Fords, which only charged at 3.3 kilowatts anyway. So it couldn't actually take that much power. The Bolt that we have charges at 7.5 kilowatts at max. So it can take the 30 amp, um, you know, or, or 40 amp thing that we have, but we just don't need it that fast. You know, it's, it's a kind of, and my next door neighbor was talking to me and he said, well, I'm, I, you know, I'm thinking about an EV, but I really don't want to put a, a, a different kind of charger in there. And I said to him, Lou, you, you drive two miles to go swim every morning and you go to the grocery store. Like you don't need that much. Why don't you just charge the, try a 120 volt, plug into the wall. And I think that's all you're going to need. And I think that's all a lot of people need is, you know, they just don't use their, their car that much. And if you're going on a long trip and you need to do it quickly, that's when you go and you use the, you know, supercharger down the street or something like that. So I think there's a misunderstanding and a misalignment uh, too often uh, about what's necessary. We do recommend leaving though 20 amps as headroom for the plug-in at the, the rate that's gonna give you 19 miles an hour. And so by the end of the night, you'll get you know, 120, 150 miles. And, and that's more than enough for the average person. If you needed more, then you would go to a fast charger that's not in your home anyway. So you know, we just wanted to recalibrate that from the start. There's a number of different things that have to go into your house. You know, We want people to, to be starting to migrate to heat pump washers and dryers. Uh, the furnaces go to heat pumps, the, you know, the uh, hot water going induction, cooker, all those other appliances that are future proof because they're the right technology going forward. But we really wanted to focus on the EV charging because it's one of those things where people say, well, I need so much of a bigger you know, box. And that's what happened um, to, to this person that I met who I described to you before. They said, well, if you want an EV charger, you're going to have to go to a 400 amp panel. It's just not necessary. It's really, really not necessary. So anyway, enough of that. We want to talk through panel basics. This is what we haven't seen before. And we wanted to bring it to you in very, very concrete terms that takes you from not knowing anything about electrical stuff at all all the way through understanding how you can configure your panel properly. And, um, and, and Nick and I spent a painstaking amount of time really thinking through how do we make this really simple on one hand and then bring it to the level of complexity where you can make good judgments about what needs to go into your house. So first of all, Electricity is like plumbing. And, um, you know, to let you know, you know, I, I was a juvenile delinquent in my high school years. And so they sent me to something called Votech. And so half the day I would go to vocational technical school and half the day I would go to regular school. And so I know a decent amount about these things. I hate to admit it <laughs> more than I should, but that's what my, you know, misspent youth was, was about, you know, building cars and tearing apart engines and, and doing electrical stuff. And so I knew enough about this that I remembered this analogy, which I think is really, really apt. And, and to know that this is how I learned about electricity that many years ago in high school. But if you just think about you know, what these things are and start to piece them together, the whole system of the panel and the electricity in your house and the flow of things just makes a lot more sense. So let's start with volts. Volts is related to pressure, right? And the pressure in the system is related to a couple of things that have to do with how that pressure can move right through the system. And amperage is the other thing that you need to know because volts times amps equals watts. And ultimately watts is power. And that's the usable power that you need in a house. So to, to further amplify the, the plumbing analogy, right? My, my old shop teacher used to say, Think of a water wheel, right? You need pressure and you need flow. If you had pressure without flow, you would run out of energy, right? Really fast. So it'd be a little burst of energy and it would stop, right? The flow and the pressure gives you the ability to turn a water wheel, right? And the amount of the, the size of the water wheel is something you have to imagine. How big of a water wheel can you turn with the pressure and the flow? And if it's a, just a little water wheel, you don't need much pressure. You don't need much flow. If it's a really big 
water wheel, you need a lot of pressure and you need a lot of flow. And that's what we're examining here. So the flow is amperage, right? How much flow is dependent on the size of the pipe. And the size of the pipe here is equivalent to the size of the wiring that you have. And there's different gauges of wire that give you different flow. And there's more resistance um, in a, a small wire and there's less resistance in a bigger wire. And those are called ohms. I didn't put that in there because it's less relevant to exactly what we need to do. You just need to know that volts times amps equals watts and watts is the power uh, that we need. And, and then we're gonna, any questions on that? Any questions in the chat? Because this is like no. the foundational stuff. And then we're gonna move, you know, we're gonna amplify it from here. Okay, so now a thousand watts is a kilowatt. Everybody talks about kilowatts, KWs, okay? So that's the raw power that's required in that moment, right? And a kilowatt hour, and these things are oftentimes, and I will be the first to admit, sometimes I say kilowatt when I actually mean kilowatt hour, Right. And Nick is very good at catching me on that. And he says, do you mean kilowatts or kilowatt hours? It's there's a big difference between the two. So, for example, my solar system that I have on my roof is six point five kilowatts. Kilowatts. So that is the amount of power that it can deliver. Right. Um, and specifically. In an hour's time, that system can deliver 6.5 kilowatt hours in, an hour, in one hour, but it's rated at 6.5 kilowatts, the whole system, because that's how, how much pressure and, and flow can be produced by that system, right? If that makes sense. And then over time is the kilowatt hours. So in one kilowatt hour, it can, at full sun, it can produce 6.5 kilowatt hours. Okay. And, and, and in reverse, um, my car charger, right, is using 7.5 kilowatt, kilowatts um, is what it uses. And if I ran it for an hour, it would use 7.5 kilowatt hours. Does that make sense for everybody? Again, this is the foundational stuff. You need to understand this and um, to make it work. Okay. Any questions yet, Nick? Just a good? yes. Keep on. Yay. All right, here we go. All right, so now we have to understand, right? We went back and remember we talked about that water wheel, right? You can't push the giant water wheel if you don't have enough pressure in flow. And so we have to make sure that we're sizing the panel appropriately. And a couple of common sizes of panels that we see are an 80 amp panel. Our old house had an 80 amp panel in it um, from 1959, right? There just wasn't that much electrical stuff. Most of it was run by gas. Most of the heavy lifting, the water heating and the furnace were run by gas. So they put an 80, panel, 80 amp panel in it. Most common uh, from through the 70s, 80s and 90s, that's a 100 amp panel. And more recently, a 200 pa amp panel has become more standard. But the number at the end is what I want to focus you on because an 80 amp panel and, and the electricity coming into the house is at 240 volts from the telephone, you know, from the, from the utility, from Southern California Edison that comes into your house is at 240 volts for most people. And times 80 amps is 19,200 watts. Um, or 19.2 kilowatts. That is the maximum peak load that your house can do. If it is asked to do any more than that, the main breaker will break and, and, and the house will shut down, right? The electricity to the house will shut down. And the same thing for 100 amp hours, the maximum you could at peak load. And what I mean by peak load is, is every single thing that you had on in there is on at the same time then you could not exceed 24 kilowatt hour, uh, kilowatts. You see, I almost did it, I almost did it there, right? You could not exceed 24 kilowatts, that pressure and the flow could not exceed that. And a 200 amp panel, we have 48 kilowatts, 
right, as the maximum. So that's how we're looking at these panels. <clears throat> and it's important to understand for each one of these things, how much energy you're going to have to need. And, and that's the, the key to it. So the average all electric house in California, all electric, no gas, right? Um, and I found this and, and I, it's one of those Google search things. I think it's the Energy Commission who gave me this number, but I can't find the reference. So I'll get, I'll get back to you with the reference, but I'm sure I wrote it down correctly. It's 12,128 uh, kilowatt hours per year. So approximately a thousand kil kilowatt hours a month is what everybody who has an all electric house on average would use, right? <clears throat> and the average uh, cost is 32 cents a kilowatt hour. And that's not including time of use and all. We're gonna have another conversation about that later. But um, so it's about $320 a month in electricity to run that house. We don't wanna pay that much. And so we think that solar is really important for that reason because it gets that cost down significantly for the energy that you're using. The average peak load, and this concept of a peak load is what are all of the things that are being used in that moment, right? And what's the maximum that you would get to on average? And the average peak load um, for a house, all electric house in California is 10 kilowatts. And I have trouble getting to 10, quite frankly, in, in our house. I have a little meter that sits by my elbow here. I don't know if I can pull it up. I don't know if the cord's long enough. No, the cord's not long enough. But I, it just shows me at, at any moment how much energy we're using. And I don't think I've seen it go to 10 almost ever, right? But let's go back one, right? The average, uh, and we have a 200 amp panel in our house, right? I've never seen it go past 10. And we have the capacity for 48 so we have just so much headroom. We overbuilt for our house, you know, essentially. I could even have installed a 100 amp panel. And at 24, it would be hard for me to get all the way up there. Uh, we just got rid of our electric dryer, which used 3,000 watts uh, when you turned it on, right? So I'd have to use 3,000 watts there, another 7.5 for my car charger, I have two car chargers, which by the way, we don't even recommend. I wouldn't recommend that anybody put two car chargers in. That was kind of like a flourish for us, but we didn't understand all this. I would have to start both of them up at the same time, run that, run my oven and, and my induction cooktop all at the same time to get anywhere close to 24 kilowatts, right? So we, we want you to understand there's something called coincidence factor that's built into the National Energy Code that says that they don't electrical expect code. the electrical yeah. code that mm -hmm. they don't expect all these things to be running at the same time. And that's why in our panel, for example, they put a sub panel in. I'll explain this too when, when we do our case study uh, later. They put it, um, they put a 90 amp breaker on my sub panel because all at the time, all of the wires, nobody's seen this many wires coming into the same place. And they said, wait, there's too many wires coming into the same place. We need to put a sub panel over here so that some of the wires are going over there. And they did a 90 amp breaker for the sub panel, but there's, uh, and I didn't count them up. There's probably 170 kilowatts in you know of breakers in that sub panel but because of the coincidence factor not all of them are going to run at the same time so they could never break the night i've never broken the 90 um 90 I bet you amp mean 170 breaker. amps right Robert? 170 amps yes yeah. i'm sorry yeah. what did i say kilowatts yeah. i'm sorry thank you yeah these yes. these these units are are tough sometimes yes know. yes to keep it all clear and so we tried we're trying here to make it the simplest thing that we possibly can so let us know if we're not making it simple enough so a 6.5 kilowatt solar system as, as i mentioned before generates 6.5 kilowatts at peak which gets close to that 10 kilowatts and we're trying to as much as possible use less energy in the middle of the day than our solar is producing 
And that's really the goal to keeping your energy build down, especially with NEM3 coming forward. We won't get into all the details of that, but essentially that's the idea. Use as much solar underneath the mountain of your energy production from your solar system as you possibly can. And knowing these numbers and knowing what's running, now we only charge our car, for example, in the middle of the day when we, we possibly can. You know, we plug it in when we know the sun shining and our solar panels are producing because it's just far less expensive to do it that way. So um, again, we, we talked about this a little bit. If 20 amps will do the job, it's better than 30 or 40 amps. And that applies to your car charging and also applies to your HVAC system, for example. And Nick will talk about that in a second. But EV chargers at 120 volt, 20 volts that I was talking about my neighbor before at 15 amps. That's what he would just plug in to the wall socket and then plug into his car. It gives you 1.8 kilowatts per hour or six miles an hour. And for him, that's more than enough, you know, uh, to charge his car. Um, if you needed more, 240 at 20 amps is 4.5 or 4.8 kilowatts per hour and it gives you 19 miles per hour. And so overnight you can get over a hundred miles. Most people don't drive a hundred miles a day. Uh, so it's more than enough. And again, if you needed more then you go to a 50 amp a 40 or a 50 amp and that gives you 12 kilowatts per hour or 40, 48 miles per hour. But just, you know, thinking about these things we realize that most people will never use uh, what a 50 amp um, breaker will give them in terms of, you know, it's just unnecessary. And so we, we just wanted to illuminate that for people so that there's just more opportunity to use what they have and not have to do expensive upgrades that are not needed. Um, and, and we see how difficult that is. All right, Nick, you want to take it from here and talk about the NEC yeah. code? Thanks for laying the groundwork, Robert. Yeah, that was what we've been mean working to do for a very long time. So thanks yeah. for the opportunity. So the National Electric Code provides for two pathways to size an electric panel. Method one is load calculations. Method two is historical usage. Load calculations, which we'll walk you through in a spreadsheet tool in a minute, takes each system's uh, maximum electricity usage. Um, it calculates a base load, which is things like lighting and receptacles based on square footage. It takes the full amount of heating and cooling power because conceivably if that HVAC system has been sized right for your house, then at one point in the year, it should run flat out, right? So therefore we need to reserve at least that much power. EV chargers get factored in at 125% of their full load which is why Robert's focus on not oversizing those EV circuits is so apt, okay? Then he mentioned the coincident multipliers. All those other things, your water heater, your garbage disposal, get factored in at 40% because they're not gonna run all concurrently. So therefore you can Put more amperage in your house um, than that maximum rating of your panel. L let me put that another way. Let's say you open your panel and it says 100 amps. And then you start adding up the amps of the circuits. You see a 30 for HVAC and you see a, a 20 for your uh, oven. And, and pretty soon you're like, oh, shoot, I'm already over 100. Well, that would be an incorrect approach to sizing your panel because of this coincident factor. Many of those circuits are going to get valued only at 40%. But then finally, you sum up all those calculated loads, and that's what you design your panel to. So that's what electrical engineers typically do for new homes when they need to size the panel. What I'm unsure of is how many electricians, when you call them to retrofit your house, are actually doing these calculations. Now, method two, but we're going to equip you to hold them accountable. Method two is historical usage. The code also allows for a pathway where you take your actual usage for a year, or if you use a power meter, you're allowed to use 30 days and you 
directly measure the maximum power usage in kilowatts and size to that. Note though that if you've got a solar system, which will alter what the meter sees, right? The meter sees the net usage of your house, the raw usage less the solar offset. If you have a solar system, you're not permitted to use this historical usage approach unless you submeter the solar system so you can remove it from the calculation. So your electrician takes a look at your project and just like HVAC subs and many other subs, they don't want callbacks, they want an insurance factor. Um, so they tend to recommend a panel size that may not be based on this full electric code approach. Um, better to have too much power in their minds. So when it comes to managing that subcontractor, show them your monthly electric use, download it from your local utility and show them, hey, look, I found the peak was in September 11th at 4 p.m. and all I was using was, was seven kilowatts or whatever it is. Or take that other approach where you itemize each circuit, show them the power requirements of each circuit, ask them to calculate the panel size accordingly, or better yet, calculate it yourself using Watt Diet. Ask them to show you their calculations, but also we're trying to fit electrification projects into the current panel size as much as possible. Understand that while also future proofing the homes. So it's, it's not productive to do a major remodel project, um, fit everything just under your panel uh, amperage size. And then you have a, you add the ADU that you plan to add all along and now you need a larger power source, right? So also think about those future loads that are going to come online at your house and plan for those. And if those require a higher, a larger panel, so be it, your future proofing as part of your, of your project. Now, a pitfall that Robert and I have run into is this abstract conversion from gas to electric. So let's say you've got a mixed fuel house, it's got a gas furnace and a gas water heater, and you're planning to electrify. Well, if you just take gas usage times this abstract conversion factor um, and say, this is how much electricity we're gonna need, it's gonna lead to way oversizing the panel. So what you want to do instead of that approach is find the electric systems that replace the gas systems, uh, size them right, and then use that volts and amps to size your panel, right? Don't use that abstract sizing pitfall. And Nick, we, we have a question from Richard. Uh, what is the translation factor between monthly slash annual kilowatt hour usage and peak kilowatt? Uh, the average coincidence factor. I don't know of any way to simply simply get to a peak from a periodic usage because it's just so many variables there. Do you, Robert? I don't. I I agree. It's yeah. um yeah, it's very very dependent on what you're running and um and how you're running it. Like like I said, we we got rid of our gas dryer, and that would you know at three thousand um, kilowatts. Or 3,000 watts, it was one of our biggest peak contributors, and it's completely gone now. And our heat pump uh, dryer now only runs maximum at 500 watts. Yeah. So okay. it's really dependent. A lot to okay. keep getting through. So let me show yep. you these tools that we wanted to highlight. Shout out to Redwood Energy and Tom Cabot, who developed this spreadsheet-based tool and made it freely available for download via this link we've provided to you here. They call it Watt Diet. I don't know. I wouldn't have called it a diet. 
slight <laughs> negative connotation, but you get the idea, right? How That's do you funny. fit what you want to do under what you have? Yeah. Right? Um, and so what it does is there's a series of sheets that lead up to this sheet number three, where you're telling it details. How big's your house? Um, what's the the heating and cooling design temperatures? So those first two sheets are are trying to get some basic information and then size an HVAC system to your house. Keep in mind that HVAC sizing subroutine is based on heating being the dominant, uh, the, the higher peak for you than cooling. That's not going to be the case everywhere, right? There's going to be plenty of places in um, 3C Ren territory, slightly inland off the coast, where cooling peak is higher than heating peak. So uh, you might need a larger HVAC system than this tool would recommend. Just keep that in mind. Um, and then you just fill out this spreadsheet. The gray parts come automatically from the base load calculations based on your square footage. And you tell it what you're planning to install or what you currently have the volts and amps uh, that those require. It automatically applies the coincident factor of 0.4 to those loads that qualify for it, adds it all up, and finds the minimum panel size for that set of circuits. Um, it also has a part right be be above the final tally for power sharing, these are, so that's where you would put a device that would put multiple systems on a single circuit. The National Electric Code provides for um, only counting systems that are on shared circuits like that with approved circuit sharing devices once in the calculation. So that's one of our key tools that we have to come in under an existing panel size. And we'll show you some of those systems that are on the market for that coming up. So this example is a 125 amp panel. And you see, in my view, it's got everything you could possibly need in an all electric house. It's got a, a washer dryer, in this case, a heat pump dryer, but there's room to put a, a bigger one if you wanted. Uh, it's got an induction range. It's got a 30 amp, 240 volt heat pump water heater, a heat pump for heating and cooling. And this one has a 40 amp EV charging circuit, which as Robert argued earlier, is probably more than most families need. Still coming in at 125 amps suitable for this house. Any questions before I show them some of these systems? Okay. No, you're good. So how do you make a small panel work? This is the guts that we wanted to cover with you today. And first you choose power efficient appliances. A great example is the heat pump water heater. I have a 120 volt, 15 amp, heat pump water heater with no electric resistance backup element for my main house. The ADU has a 240 volt 30 amp. So that is what, four times the amount of power to do the same job, right? So choose power efficient appliances. I, that goes for EV charging too, right? Allocate the, the minimum amount of power you need for that use. Second, Efficient appliances, don't ignore efficiency because the more efficient your appliance is, the less power it needs. Um, so that goes for heat pumps especially. And then use these circuit sharing and circuit pausing devices for circuits that belong together, circuits that are unlikely to need to run at the same time. So a perfect example is that if you have a 240 volt electric dryer in the garage, you could share that with your 240 volt 
EV charging circuit. They're unlikely to need to go to run at the same time. Another good example would be your induction cooktop and your EV charger. And they make devices that will pause the EV from charging while that other circuit needs the power. How cool is that, right? This really is an area that's, there's a lot of innovation right now because people are just starting to realize how needed these, these appliances are. Fourth, right size your HVAC system. You can probably get by in many houses with a 20 amp HVAC system or 30 amp for a large house. And there's no reason to install, you know, larger systems or multiple systems. Remember that HVAC gets, gets calculated at 100% of that maximum load. That's key to know right there. That's mm -hmm. the key to that one. So if you can minimize that particular one, especially uh, that generally has to be running all the time, it's key. Yeah. So it's possible that doing the blocking and tackling of green building, choosing good windows and insulating well, may allow you to reduce the amount of power required by your HVAC system slightly and decrease your loads. Well, that's what I was just saying. So let's go through each of these one at a time. Power efficient appliances first. If 120 volts will do the job, it's half as much power as 240 volts, right? If 20 amps will do the job, it's half as much power as 40 amps. Um, the energy code, Title 24, let me, let me put that hat on right now. The Title 24 hat um, requires load counts. And yet I, I promise you many of your HVAC subs aren't going to do them unless you ask them to. By doing those HVAC load calcs, you may find that the current system you have installed is oversized and you can drop down the power required for your HVAC system by right sizing that new replacement heat pump. Now on water heating, there's a lot of clients who come to me and say, we're right on board with this electrification thing. We heard the governor Newsom talk about how important it is. And I just chose this awesome electric tankless uh, that I want you to use in your title 24 compliance documents. And I have to tell them, oh, I wish we'd talk sooner because electric resistance is going to use three times the power and the electricity as a heat pump water heater. There's just no reason to choose electric resistance technology for anything except toasters. They don't make heat pump toasters yet. <laughs> I'm waiting. Yeah. <laughs> I'm waiting. Nick, we have a question. Um, so Dominique asks, why did you opt for a more powerful 240 volt heat pump hot water heater in your ADU versus a 120 volt uh, in your main home. And apologies if you addressed this earlier. Is yeah, the ADU Dom, you on a separate submeter or a separate meter? Simple answer. They weren't on the market yet. That's how new these 120 volt heat pump water heaters are. Ream has one. A.O. Smith has one. I don't think Bradford White even has one on the market yet. Um, but it's so interesting that they get by on less power by not having that backup resistance element. Now, yeah. if you're install, if you're electrifying a house in um, Ojai or somewhere where you're, you're anticipating that heat pump water heater is going to be subject to some cold temperatures, then you're going to want that backup resistance element. Yeah. Now, Maybe. Most of Southern California can probably do without it, but there are going to be places where you want it. Yep. And, um, and Christian. And yeah, we uh, did submeter. Uh, we did that for resale reasons, thinking, you know, when we finally move out of this house, it's going to really add value to whoever buys it to know that they can have someone rent that ADU and not have to deal with the extra electrical account. Understood. And and uh, just a question for you. How, how much extra did it cost to do the submetering? 
Do you happen to know if it, off the top of your head? You know, I'll show you a picture in a minute of the setup. There's a single uh, draw from the lines that goes to a tandem meter box. Um, I think that cost something like $8,000 or something. It was a ton. Yeah. Significant. But, but, you know, for us, it, it fit into that category of future proofing. Yeah, made sense. Um, Christian said that there are infrared toasters. They exist and they are great. Uh, we okay. have to look into that. <laughs> there are Were also they... infrared yeah. restaurant heaters, right? Yeah. Which, are, which right. are better than the gas ones. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Thank you, Christian. High efficiency appliances was the next category. And my cat Twinkle is posing for scale <laughs> on top of the ADU's outdoor unit, right? <laughs> The more efficient, the less electricity it needs to do the same work. Um, so a 21 CR2 heat pump does 50% more work than that old 14 CR2 that we, that's code minimum. Yeah. Um, heat pump water heaters have an efficiency of about 3.5, which means 350% efficient. Compare that to the electric tank list that my well-meaning client wanted to install only 96% efficient, which sounds good until you compare it to 350% efficient. And something uh, Dave Intner from Southern California Edison woke us up to, the efficiency of induction is 80% in terms of getting the power you're using into the food, electric a little bit less so, and gas only 40% efficient. Yep. Dominique had a follow-up. Uh, did you upsize the main home water heater capacity, i.e. 40 gallon to 55 gallon, and do you overheat the water and use the thermostatic mixing valve? This is the conversation that we have all, all the time, don't we, Nick? Dom, we had a gas tankless water heater, which at the time of construction in 2015 was all the rage, you'll remember. Um, we got a really nice Title 24 credit for it. It was much more efficient than a gas tank, right? Um, so no, we had a, an instantaneous version that we switched to 50 gallon and it's been more than enough. We don't hold it at an elevated temperature. We just have it at 120 with no mixing valve. And that's been entirely adequate, whether our house has just my wife here or the, our two daughters are home and there's four people here. I know Robert does use an elevated temperature set point. Don't you, Robert? I do. I do. And it works perfectly as a result of that. Uh, we like long showers. Uh, we self-admittedly, <laughs> okay. we like a nice hot shower and we can take three serial showers um, and not miss a beat. Uh, we know it, we've done it. And um, and the, the, the difference between like the, everybody vilified a tank um, in the day, right? The gas tanks, you know, they lose so much energy, and they were only 60% efficient because at the bottom, you could not insulate that tank at the bottom. I mean, think about it. The flame is going right onto the metal and it is heating that. And then there's a, there's a flue, there's a hole through the center where the you know gases go up and through the unit that can't be insulated as well. So that is why the temperature dropped. The second that the gas flame finished, the temperature started to sink because it's sitting in you know whatever condition it's sitting in, but it's immediately reversing um you know and and so heat pump hot water heaters are insulated all the way around and so just like a nice thermos bottle that you put the hot coffee in in the morning and you come back in the afternoon you still got hot coffee same idea um so it's a radically different instrument as a result of that and so uh we don't my point is we don't lose a lot by keeping the temperature at uh, 140 degrees yeah 20 minutes left. We want to get to these case studies. So let's move to load management devices. And these are either allowing for you to fit more physical circuits in your box, right? Your box is X by Y, and you have to fit those circuits in there, um, as well as fitting more amperage in that panel. We're talking about both, right? So when you have more load than your panel can deliver, you can install two appliances on one circuit with a circuit sharing device um, or a circuit pausing device 
or use these smart breakers. These are shown on the, the span panel consists of smart breakers. The breaker to the left of the span panel is from Savant. It, these are individual smart breakers that connect to an app and you can set rules up so that as your home approaches its peak usage, um, it, it adjusts the allocation of power according to your, your scenario. So these smart breakers are very interesting. Um, I think there's a future where these smart panels allow you to um, electrify within a given panel and um, but for right now, we've got to use the NEC calc that I covered earlier or the historic. Um, we can't rely on these smart panels to keep you under those loads yet. I think that's coming soon. When you need more physical space, these tandem breakers obviously are an easy way to get two circuits in one spot. If your house was built a while ago and the lighting circuits were sized for incandescent loads, you might be able to join two of those circuits together um, and, and gain back a spot that way. And then rather than tying your solar system into one of those breakers in your panel, you can use what's called a meter collar, which does it externally, not through the panel. Oh, and I was gonna, add links to this. I'll, I'll do this and send you an updated version, Sarah. Um, but we've got a smart splitter shown on the left picture, allocating power between a dryer and an EV charger, for instance. We've got the Emporia EV charging system. This one's cool. It has a current transducer shown in white there that goes around your mains and as the power usage in your mains begins to bump up against the limit, it ramps down your EV charging. <clears throat> How cool is that? Uh, so that is a, a definite way that you can fit uh, more EV charging under a panel limitation. Uh, and then on the right, this one's called Lectron. This is a circuit pausing device uh, where when it, senses that another load has come on, it pauses the secondary load until that can come back on. So that's perfect for, let's say, uh, an electric dryer and an EV charger or an induction cooktop and an EV charger. We just highlighted a few. We're not advocating for particular brands, but wanted to use real world examples. Here's a meter collar for solar. You see, instead of reserving that 20 amp breaker probably in your panel, you can bring the solar system right into your meter uh, for space contained panels, that's helpful. And then we mentioned right sizing, HVAC systems, it's well known, they're often double the size they need to be. So it's worth paying a professional to do ACA manual calculations, find out the right size HVAC system, which may free up some amperage in your panel. Ductless systems don't lose all that power up in your attic or your crawl space. So they're more efficient at providing it and could allow you to downsize as well. And don't forget about upgrading the envelope. That's the blocking and tackling we mentioned earlier. Always a good idea if your project can extend to that scope. And just choose reasonable size systems. That's great. And Nick, we have a question from Richard. Uh, what are the approximate costs for the various types of load management devices? The All of these are under $1,000 with the, even the Emporia might be under $1,000. So pretty darn reasonable, especially when you're considering a multi-thousand dollar panel upgrade. That's great. And can you see my screen full, full screen? Yes. Great. All right. So <clears throat> this is a green idea house. And again, we did this 12 year, years ago and the planning for it probably took about four years um, before we actually came out of the ground on it. So everybody was really nervous. Uh, we partnered with Southern California Edison and about, about 70 other partners uh, to bring this thing to fruition. And 
the gas people didn't understand back then really how to make the transition. And as Nick mentioned, <clears throat> they used the conversion rate. Uh, that he put up there earlier. And that's how we got, you know, I wanted to show that because that that is still used today. I still find people using, hey, you know, this is how much gas is used and we can use a conversion rate to get it to kilowatt hours. And it just doesn't, it's not necessary. And that's how we ended up with such a big panel. Uh, and, you know, people didn't, didn't understand, you know, the parts and pieces. So we wanted to talk through a number of these things. That That's a big one uh, that, you know, this building and the engineers never thought it was going to work, quite frankly. They were very, very suspicious that um, we, we would actually meet our goal of net zero energy. And again, as you saw, we not only met the goal of net zero energy, we overproduced by, um, by at least 1.7 um, megawatt hours a year. So it really does work. Uh, but you have to be careful about these things. And we've learned a lot in the process. The first thing that we, um, learned is that especially for older houses you know bringing all of the wire sets into one box did not work um the electricians couldn't get all of the wires that used to be in you know like it was like half the wire sets uh coming into one box <clears throat> so just make sure that there's room for it um going in and um so again we had the sub panel a 90 amp sub panel uh that we used and and that took the bulk of the loads for, and you can see them up, up at the top, <clears throat> we put two um, electric um, EV, electric vehicle car chargers at 40 amps. Those are the top two uh, that you see. Would never do that again. Just it's unnecessary. Um, and so we learned a lot in this process and, and that's what we wanted to share, share with you. The second thing we learned are the heat pump hot water heaters. We have two of them, one for the heating system and one for the uh, domestic hot water. They have 30 amp which you can see on the left-hand side there, that's unnecessary. So the, and if the, as Nick mentioned, at the time there was no such thing as 120 um, volt heat pump hot water heater. It didn't exist. Right. Um, so we couldn't have done it, but that for sure could be swapped. And a number of other things that we've learned in the process, but uh, we wanted to share, you know, just a couple of them with you. Um, one is about the tr trench. And, and again, anybody who's considering, you know, this process, um, the gas trenching was one of the foundational, you know, decisions right at the very early start of this process. It was going to be seven thousand dollars to dig another trench because, again, you can't put anything but the gas line in one trench. And then we had the sewer line that needed to go in there. Then we had the cable line. We had, you know, a lot of stuff can go in a trench. Uh, and our city required that if we did a fifty percent renovation, that you had to underground. And so all of the stuff had to be underground. It, we formerly had an overhead line. And because we were doing a 50% upgrade, we had to do it all underground. Um, so the fact that we could save 7,000 then, I'm sure it's over $10,000 today to do the equivalent trench. Um, and so to eliminate that additional trenching, not need an, an additional gas line, you can see what a, just a giant mess it was. A small tip for anybody who's considering a renovation as well. Um, we did the trenching in advance of the renovation. Um, and the advantage to that, which is sort of counterintuitive, is that we had a wall standing. And what we could do, we could do all the trenching work and put in the new panel into the existing structure that would still have a frame. That is, we were still using the same footprint of the building. And we knew where that new panel, we wanted that panel to go. But... <clears throat> Temporary power is very expensive uh, from the utility. They put a pole in and it's very expensive and you have to use commercial rates for that, for that temporary pole. Um, so you can save another $7,500 potentially and more on the utility costs by, by doing it in advance, if it's possible. Uh, it's not possible for everybody. It was possible for us and just saved us a ton. And um, the, the tradesmen on the site liked having you know, power where they could just plug in and then have to deal with the power pole, um, you know, that was oftentimes on the corner of the property in, in an inconvenient location. So a little tip for anybody considering that. The second tip, uh, we learned the hard way <clears throat> and, and that is to install a surge protector, a whole house surge protector, um, a transformer blue, 
um, in our neighborhood and we actually saw green light out the window. I don't know if anybody has had this experience. I thought we were being invaded by aliens, but <laughs> it was it was the transmission line. Just I was crazy how and it started three fires down our block <clears throat> and it blew out a bunch of stuff in our in our project. Um, and when you sign up <clears throat> with utilities to have your solar system connected to the transmission lines, um, they make you sign a non um, a hold harmless agreement. <clears throat> and that means that if you destroy something on their pro property, um, you're not you know, responsible and vice versa. The probability of you destroying something on their property is very low, um, but vice versa is very high. And so it blew out half of our inverters. <clears throat> and then they said, well, we're not responsible for those. So this is a little piece of insurance. Uh, it costs about 250 or $300. And it plugs in, plug it into the <clears throat> to the breaker immediately next to the main. That's the key. Or otherwise, it'll go through and fry every other breaker until it hits this thing. So you want to put it next to the breaker coming in from the main, and it will save a lot of aggravation and trouble. Um, again, very small insurance policy. Um, <clears throat> We also wanted to bring, you know, to light some of the experiences that we've had in working with people. And and um, a, a gentleman came to me who who has a house exactly like this, 1930s bungalow, 80 amp panel. He said, "I'd love to electrify. You guys have been teaching this class forever, and we love everything that you're doing. We'd love to cut off the gas line, and but we don't think we can do it with 80 amps." And Nick and I put our heads together and we went through exactly what he just detailed for you to change everything out. Um, one of the things that we use was it's called an EFOCA, and it's a heat pump through the wall unit um, that only requires two eight inch ports. So especially for an architecturally sensitive building like this, you don't want some sort of, you know, giant piece of machinery on the outside of the thing. You don't need an exterior um, compressor. Uh, so it's really very, very um, sensitive to architectural. And it's made by an Italian company who installed these in the Vatican. That's how sort of architecturally sensitive that they wanted to be. And it's a beautiful little unit um, that also has some advantages. It also has a MER 13 filter uh, on it. And it also can be installed with an, um, an ERV. So it makes it very, very energy efficient. And, um, and also it helps to purify the air at the same time. And he installed three of those, which were basically the same price as a, as a split unit that would have gone in the same place. And the beauty of that is he could plug it into his wall just as an outlet. It's a 120 volt unit. And so he didn't, again, have to upgrade the breaker box uh, to do it. He installed a 120 watt or 120 volts um, heat pump washer dryer combo, puts all the clothes in and they come out dry. I'm, I'm just waiting for AI though to fold them. Right. I don't need AI to do my music or my art or any, like, but fold my clothes would you fold my, and put my dishes away. Those are the two. So can somebody work on that? Some AI people out there? Can, can we work on that? OK. And 120 volt induction cooking is also possible um, with this unit from right from Amazon uh, or another more specialty, a couple of specialty units which have batteries in them that allow you to get the big burst of energy that makes it feel like a 240 volt uh, um, induction cooktop like Nick and I have. Um, the 120 volt units are fine, but they don't, they're not as fast as the 200, they're half as fast, quite frankly, as the 200 volt, 240 volt units. So these guys have installed batteries in them that basically charge up and then give you that sort of burst of energy that you would, you would feel with a 240 volt um, unit. And then we went through the calcs uh, and then he was able to use his 80 amp panel to do everything that he needed to do in terms of heat pump. Uh, again, we, we did a 120 volt um, heat pump hot water heater. Uh, so again, just plugged in, it didn't need a special breaker. So point by point by point, these things are all possible and it never exceeded the peak load. So he never broke, you know, he never broke his main as a result of it because of the coincidence factor that we were talking about in, in, uh, in the previous comments. Um, and then this is Nick's uh, case study. Yeah, and notice that that 80 amp panel included a 20 amp EV charger as part of exactly. it. Exactly. Didn't even exactly. need circuit sharing devices. Right. So this was my house. Um, 
we had a 200 amp panel when we started. Um, I hadn't even conceived teaching a class like this, so I wasn't overly focused on the panel, to be honest. Uh, but we knew we were going to electrify it eventually, and the ADU was being added all electric. Both houses had solar systems. So the question was, would they fit in 200 amps? And the answer was yes. Um, 225 amps. We, the main house, if you can see on the right picture, there's a 100 amp breaker for the ADU meter and a 125 for the main house. Um, so that shows you the main house, even though it's 2000 square feet and all electric, can get by just fine on 125. And many of, many of your single family homes, you know, may fall under that as well. And that's with an EV charger and solar and all that. Um, and this was the tandem meter with a single drop from Edison. And then each house has a sub panel, the main house on the left, the ADU on the right. Um, why are these always so poorly labeled? It's just a universal <laughs> thing, isn't it? Um, Yours are I've better probably, than most. I should have, I, I should have given, given it more effort. But you see some of these um, breaker spots are still available. There's one available in each panel right now. Uh, the solar uh, the solar could have gone straight into the meters instead of using up this breaker space as well. And here's what the watt diets look like on those two panels. The main house on the left came in at 118. Uh, the ADU on the right actually came in at 60. Wow. Um, so 100 is more than that little place needed. So hopefully these case studies help you understand how you can apply this NEC approach using Watt Diet. Now, right now we're working with a multifamily example I wanted to share with you in our last minute. It's a, it's a gas heavy building, a gas wall furnace in each unit, no cooling, central gas water heating, gas ranges, a central gas clothes dryer. And this is one of those where our attendee brought up it has a faulty panel. The insurance company is refusing to continue to cover this building until it's upgraded. And they've determined that 400 amps is the minimum size upgrade. They also want to replace all the sub panels in each unit and the wiring in between. So we thought perfect opportunity to electrify this building and to make use of the incentive programs to pay part of the cost of what they're being forced to do anyway. So we're planning to install a ductless mini split in each unit, a central heat pump water heater, probably a couple of those 80 gallon tanks will do this whole building. We'll have to do some calculations on that. Induction ranges, um, replace the current gas dryer with an electric version. And we think we can get this done with a 600 amp main panel and 60 amp sub panels, which is not a big cost upgrade from what the insurance company is requiring anyway. And sure enough, we did watt diet on a single unit and it came in at, at 50 each unit. Uh, and then all we need is the extra panel for the central hot water and laundry. I put right in the beginning of chat, we're at time, but I put a link to the scavenger hunt that we use for our planning your home electrification class. It just takes you around your house and gives you a way to record all the systems you currently have as part of a future electrification plan. So if you scroll all the way up, oh, Sarah's on top of it. Thank you. <laughs> She's right on it. We'll, we'll let you read those working with contractor tips at your leisure. We've given you a few links, including some incentive programs that are most beneficial for electrification, BDC and Watt Diet. And we'd love to hear your, your stories as you apply this material. 25 of you showing up shows it was really a hot topic and something that maybe you guys are facing. So thank you for being here. And I'll hand it over to Sarah to summarize. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Nick and Robert. Um, 
my initial first lesson learned is this class could definitely be two hours next year. So <laughs> could be. Uh, yeah, so so much information. Um, but uh, just in closing, uh, we always try to plug our Energy Code Coach service. Uh, it's free to uh, residents and those who have projects in our tri-county region, so counties of San Luis Obispo, uh, Santa Barbara, and Ventura. Uh, we have a, a web forum, and we also have our hotline there. Um, and then uh, there are learning units available for this class. So um, for those that are looking for AIA or ICC, feel free to email me. And if you provided that information when you registered, I have it. And I'll go ahead and um, confirm your attendance and then give you those, those uh, credits. Um, and then if, there will be a email coming out to your inboxes. Um, with a link to the slides, a link to the recording, um, and then also with a survey. And that reminds me, I want to go ahead and launch, um, this is a different survey than the one that's in the email. Uh, this is a new course for our catalog. Um, so this survey just really helps us gauge the, the knowledge of the, the course, the presenters, just kind of gives us that extra information so that we can keep developing new courses and the um how this one was received um and then we have our upcoming courses there there's a bunch those are all links so when you get the slides you can click on them the one that i will highlight that is starting tomorrow is our certified passive house designer or consultant training it's um all online it's hybrid but it's on demand and live uh webinars um, but that one's starting tomorrow. So if anyone is interested in doing or becoming certified to do passive house design, um, definitely fill out the interest form on our website. Um, yeah, so with that, I know that we're over time. So if anyone needs to hop off, please do so. Um, but thank you all for joining us. And thank you again, Nick and, and Robert for a great course. Our pleasure. pleasure. Thanks Happy for the opportunity. Happy to stick around Sarah. for questions too. Yeah, and Nick, we did have a question. Uh, with this system, <clears throat> I think they were um, referring to your, uh, yeah. So Nick, would this system work if the ADU was 1,000 to 1,200 square feet? Well, we'd have to do the watt diet calculation. Exactly. You change the square footage, which will increase that base load. And then you, you might need a slightly larger heat pump, uh, whether that requires more power or not. You know, you'll have to check with the manufacturer. So that encourage you to do that process and report back to us. Yeah. I mean, my, my guess is that the way you built that thing, uh, you would have no trouble uh, use those SIPS panels. Uh, so the air sealing and the insulation are superb on that unit. And like you said, you hardly need any heating and cooling uh, in that unit as a result of how you built it. I I bet it'd work, given that our 2,000 square foot all electric house is working on 125, yeah, and probably less than that. Anything else? Nothing at this point. Okay. Yeah, I think that was great. Great. Well, thanks again, everyone. Um, hope you have a great rest of your afternoon. Um, and yeah, you'll get links to the presentation slide and the recording um, soon. So thank you. That's super. Thanks so much, Sarah. Thanks, enjoyed it. Yep. Thanks. Bye. Bye, guys.